All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Todd Palmer, who is the chief rule breaker at Extraordinary Advisors. And he is uh, joining us today from Detroit, Michigan. How are you doing, Todd? Oh, I'm doing great, John. Thanks so much for having me back on the show. Absolutely. And hey, who doesn't want to be chief rule breaker? That's probably the best title of anybody. Uh, and we're going to talk about your new book, right? So, From Suck to Success, A Guide for Extraordinary Entrepreneurship. Um, so, uh, so, Todd, this book was released in February, I'm, if I'm correct, of this year? That's correct, yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, just give me the, the background and the genesis to, to this book, why you wrote it, and, uh, and why you think it's particularly applicable at this time. Well, uh, it's a great question. I wrote it basically for either that startup entrepreneur who's just starting their journey, and, and certainly sales is going to be a big part of that journey, so I'm, that's partially why I'm really happy to be in front of your audience, because uh, if you can't sell, you can't eat. It's very important yep. as an entrepreneur. <laughs> Um, and secondarily, I, I really wrote it for myself, uh, for, for that entrepreneur who is coming out of the COVID situations, who is struggling with being stuck. Uh, when I started my entrepreneurial journey, I was 27 years old. I didn't know what I didn't know. And what I try to do in the book is take people through the mindset in the first four chapters of what it's like to be an entrepreneur, what it's like to deal with the itty bitty negative committees in our head. And, and what it's like to be able to, to get unstuck around tough decisions, around people, cash, strategy, and execution, and then pivot into some of the best strategies and executions I've seen from around the globe. I, I bring in you know, uh, leaders like Brian Scudamore from 1-800-GOT-JUNK is in the book, uh, Nigel Bennett from AquaGuard, uh, one of the largest uh, oil response spill recovery teams in the world. He leads that group. And classics like Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank and Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken, a wide variety of people who had to go from suck to success. And I, I wanted their stories to be out in the open into, into a public right now that's coming out of a pandemic situation. And a lot of startup entrepreneurs who maybe don't know what they're getting themselves into, just like I didn't know, gosh, uh, oh my gosh, 24 years ago. <laughs> wow. Uh, and I like, uh, the, so the first thing that you, you cover in your book is the taking inventory part one and it says, figure out your mindset first. So how do you go about figuring out your mindset? Because I think this is a, this is a critical thing because I know we talk a lot about mindset and people understand the concept of mindset, but I think if you asked, you know, most people to be completely honest about what their mindset was, they would find it hard to tell you. So a lot, of a lot of people become entrepreneurs, at least a lot of the ones I work with, in the, especially in their younger days, they, they become entrepreneurs because they want to get rich. They want to sell a lot of their services, sell a lot of their products, sell a lot of their ideas, and get paid a lot of money. Nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. the, the reality for most entrepreneurs, though, is that the, the external world, the, the trappings, the, the toys, the cars, the boats, the houses, the money it, it is, it is symptomatic. The root cause of typically why a lot of entrepreneurs want to become entrepreneurs is because they want to prove something to themselves or someone else. They want to heal um, childhood wounds from other parts and places. They want to uh, compete with a family member who's successful. They want, to, they, want, they want to get that external validation from the world. Whereas, whereas you know, a mindset shift a lot of us, at least the clients that I coach, go through is why, why do you really want these things? What, you know, money's, money's fine. Money really is just a mechanism for more freedom and mm -hmm. flexibility. Money is just something that allows you different choices and options. It's not necessarily, it doesn't make you quote unquote, a better human being. And so when we're working with people around their mindset, we want them to start with what is your purpose? A lot of us start off with well, the how, not the why. So yeah. shifting your mindset takes you into the why. And we use the Ikigai model, which is a pretty popular model. We didn't invent that. Um, and, and it takes people uh, through the diagnostic of trying to figure out why they do what they do, better yet, why do they do the things that prevent them from doing the things they say they want to do, and ultimately getting them wrapped around that purpose. I was blessed a dozen years ago. I worked with a guy named Simon Sinek, wrote The Power mm -hmm. of Why. He's got one of the, I think, one of the top three all time yeah. YouTube videos. And for two years, I figured out two words improve lives. 
So now when I make a decision, now when I take my inventory, now when I figure out my mindset, I anchor it back into improving lives. So any decision I make, whether it's to, to work with a client, whether it's to take on a new engagement, to give a new speech, to show up on a podcast, the, the goal of me being here is to have someone hear something that will potentially somewhere, somehow, magically improve their life. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And I think it's a, it's a great point about, about purpose, because I think when you start into anything, yeah, like it's great to have goals, as you said, like, you know, making money and all that good, good stuff, which is great. And, and don't get me wrong, I think f- having financial freedom is, is, fan, is fantastic. Oh, yeah. However, however, uh, as you said, the purpose and the why is what will get you through the tough times. Uh, and I think that's, and, and as you know, in any entrepreneurial journey, you're going to have serious obstacles, particularly early on. Oh, uh, uh, for sure. I, or coming out of a pandemic, you're going to have certainly some yeah. obstacles. And I want to double back, though, to the, the point you make, because I think it's really critical for entrepreneurs to understand. And I highlight this at, in every chapter of the book. Every chapter of the book concludes with an active learning cycle, which is so key because it, it, all, it all starts from you figuring out your purpose, your why. And then any problem can be solved in your business, uh, in your personal life, in your marriage, in, with your family, with, with anyone, if we use the active learning cycle to, to get people unstuck. Because what happens when we incorporate the active learning cycle, we actually use the, the front cerebral cortex part of our brain. When, and we're more intentional, we're more aspirational, we're much more creative. When we're fixed mindset, a non-growth mindset, where we're very much focused on an expectation of being good at something or an expectation of getting the deal, we're in a very fixed mindset, which is actually using the reptilian, the least evolved part of our mm-hmm. brain. So the, the, the psychology behind it, I, and I give full credit to my coach. My coach is from San Diego, Dr. Danny Friedland, and he, he wrote the, the intro to my book out of the generosity uh, of the, just an amazing human being that he is. And, and he talks extensively about why we want to use the highest operating parts of our brain versus the least operating parts of our brain to keep us unstuck. And that goes very much into what we're talking about right now and in, in getting to more of that growth mindset. Yeah, no, that, that is really fascinating. Uh, uh, absolutely. And, and I think that I'm hoping maybe that the pandemic has, uh, if there's an upside to it, uh, that maybe it has allowed people a little bit of space and time to do a little bit more exploration, particularly self-exploration. Uh, you talk about learning to be authentic, transparent, and vulnerable in the book as well. Uh, so how do you learn to be authentic? I mean, is authentic authenticity innate, or do people need to understand how to actually tap into their true selves? Well, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I think for most of us, me included, it's something we have to learn. I think, I think as kids, we know it, and it gets mm-hmm. kind of taught out of us or depending on how old we are, maybe our parents beat us out, beat it out of us. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's, it, when we, when we become entrepreneurs, my, my biggest thing is I had a massive bout of imposter syndrome, which prevented me from right. being authentic, transparent, and vulnerable. And for me, the, the, the imposter syndrome showed up as I had to be all things to all people all the time on all topics, because if I wasn't, then I just assumed when I would go hang out with other CEOs or other peers of mine, that they had it all figured out and I suck. And they're, they're smart and I'm stupid. And all the different itty bitty negative committee meetings that had and happened in my head to the point where it prevented me from showing up and being real. And then what I did is I started making decisions in a vacuum. I started isolating. I didn't go to my team at the, that I had at the time and share with them how bad the business was. As I talk about in the book, I was $600,000 in debt on a 2 million run rate. For, for anybody with a, a basic understanding of accounting, I was upside down. <laughs> I didn't understand that. And I didn't want to tell anybody that because, oh, God forbid, I didn't figure out I don't know what I'm doing. When clearly the numbers showed, I didn't know what I was doing. So for me to be authentic, transparent, and vulnerable requires me to communicate, communicate, and then communicate again. Um, During the pandemic, a lot of people were sending out emails. I coached my clients to send out videos to their teams when they Mm -hmm. weren't shut down so they could hear you, they could see you, they could see your your hand gestures, your body language, you hear your voice inflect. Um, and then it's, it's important to deal with our brutal reality. Mine was, I was $600,000 in debt and I wasn't telling anybody. Well, for me to stand up and say that, believe it or not, while it was embarrassing, I actually felt better and I right. felt a relief. So it, it, for, to be authentic, transparent, and vulnerable is a learned skill. And it's also, but a big part of it too, is either creating a safe space within yourself 
that if someone judges you, that's okay. Or to create a safe space within your tribe, within your community, within a, a peer-to-peer group like EO or YPO, where you can show up and be yourself. That All those things come into play, allowing you to be who you really are, which in most cases, most people on that are actually pretty cool. Yeah. Most of us are pretty lost on certain <laughs> things, like I was lost around the numbers. But we, once we're able to, to clear that crap out of the way and show up and get the help, it's amazing how many people actually want to coach us, help us, mentor us. Yeah, and, and I think that's a critical point uh, here because I think too often we get this idea that if we're to be taken seriously as an expert or in our field, that we have to have the answers to everything. And But I've discovered over time that actually the, the experts, the people who I really trust are the people who will tell you when they don't know something. They're just say, I don't know, I don't know that. And here's somebody who may know that. But that whole idea of... Uh, you know, thinking that you have to know everything. I do think that holds people back from from reaching out and getting the help because let's face it, we can't be good at everything. It'd be, I mean, that'd be ridiculous. Well, the re- I figured out that is a little secret. I'm only good at a few things. I got a yeah. whole list of things. I'm like, I'm bad at painting walls. We just had a painter in the house th- last week. I stink yeah, at that. I shouldn't do I'm that. I'm there with you. And it, it, but it's so interesting because people like you and I get, you know, schools, universities, associations, groups want us to come and talk about success. I remember I got invited to go speak at a university after the, our business made the Inc. 5000. It was one of the fastest growing companies in America one time. They brought me back five years later because we made it six times. And the dean is like, we want you to talk about success. And I'm like, I don't want to talk about success. I want to talk about the hero's journey of being an entrepreneur, the highs and the lows. Mm-hmm. Uh, we made the Inc. 5000 six times as we were digging out of the crap and the debt and, and fixing processes and sealing up holes in our boat, so to speak, versus... My goal was to make the Inc. 5,000 six times. And nobody, I don't think if you, you know, you're in, you're in California, I don't think if someone goes to talk to Mike Trout, is your, is your goal to be uh, an MVP multiple times? No, my goal is to be the best baseball player I can be. Well, my goal was to turn this business around. We hockey sticked and made the Inc. six times, which is great, but it was a team. And it was, it was, a, it was through a lot of baby steps that those things happen. And when you, we get invited to talk about success, when we're on shows like yours to talk about success, I think it's so important. Like you, you highlighted the leaders who talk about all the bumps and all the mistakes and all the bruised knees and skinned elbows they had on their hero's journey. That's, I think, what makes us more real because everybody's got those bumps. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's good for people because, uh, because people always think like, oh, look, you know, Todd's overnight success. And you go, yeah, overnight success took me like, you know, 15, 20 years or whatever to be an overnight success. Right. People, don't, exactly. people don't see that part. And I think in the culture that we live in today, it's more critical than ever that people understand the process and the journey because we live in this culture where everybody thinks there are shortcuts. You can be instantaneously like famous and earning lots of money. And that's just not the reality for 99.999% of people. Well, and, and we take a look at what it's like to be an entrepreneur. You know, um, less than 5% of all businesses registered in the United States ever reach a million dollars or more in revenue. Mm-hmm. Yet you, go, you watch, you know, shows like the Shark Tank and things like that. Well, their goal is to, these are the, these people have figured out a formula on how to grow businesses quickly and good for them. No, no, I respect all those people tremendously, but it does create, I think, a false expectation for people that I'm going to start a business. Mark Cuban or Lori Grenier is going to give me a, butt, a boatload of money. They're going to tell me how smart I am, and I'm going to take the rise to the top. When you really look behind the scenes, like Lori Grenier and Mark Cuban are saying, okay, that's a really bad idea. I've just given you a bunch of money. We're not going to do that. We're going to be the adults in the room. We're going to keep the children contained because the highway of success is really, really hard. So you know, 4.3% of companies only re- ever reach a million dollars. Secondarily, the failure rate of entrepreneurs who isolate like I did, who have to deal with imposter syndrome like I had to, 80, 80 plus percent of businesses don't make it five years. Yeah. So, so for anybody taking that leap, one, we have to give them a lot of respect because those are the people who have grit, resilience, determination. The, the flip of it is like, that's what I wanted to put in the book is like the, 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 the path of success is not a rocket from point A to point 100. It's this corkscrewing, <laughs> pivoting, changing, ever evolving line, looping line of success. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that uh, phrase you have looping towards success. Uh, Because yeah, uh, like you said, I mean, unfortunately, I think sometimes we con ourselves into thinking that success is a linear path. 
or or maybe you have to take some pauses, but never this idea of actually having to go backwards or go around or go off to the side and all the things that happen in reality. And I think that's the thing that most people aren't prepared for. Well, it, or like I did, you think it's kind of an and both, right? I agree with everything you said. And another way that we deal with it is like, oh, it's really easy for, you know, for, for John to be successful because John grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth and yeah. John has this really cool accent and he's this good looking <laughs> guy and he knows how to sell and I suck. People pick, in the absence of keep going back to how, to be, we, how do we be authentic, transparent, and vulnerable, communication is so key. In the absence of that communication, we fill in a narrative and we make up the worst narrative typically for us, whether it's you know, yeah. our employees, we, we don't communicate with them. They think my boss is gonna fire me, the company's in trouble. No, I just was, I was golfing all day long. I, I just don't answer my phone when I golf. It, it's that absence of communication. So we fill in those narratives and rarely, as we're talking about right now, do those narratives ever serve us very well? No, no, no. We're fantastic at filling in the gaps uh, and filling them in negatively. Uh, you know, we rarely, as you say, we rarely, if I'm calling, you know, Todd and he's not answering today, I rarely go, oh, maybe he's off enjoying himself. Good for him. I don't really think, oh, he's ignoring me. I wonder what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, well, yeah. Well, you know, you, you sales one hundred and one, right? Yeah. It, it, we want we are, want to drive our customers really to two words: yes, you want to buy from me, and no, you don't. This whole maybe spin cycle and them avoiding us and us avoiding them, and that it just creates chaos. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And one, one last thing I just wanted to touch upon is this idea that you have is setting an intention rather than an expectation, because I think that's, I think that's a fascinating, um, a fascinating play there. Yeah. And that's what well, one, I'm glad you brought that up. And two, I have to give again credit to Danny Friedland who taught that to me, you know, because I coach people now full time. Um, I find that it's important for me to sharpen my skills. So I still have a coach. Um, and I, as I talk about in the book, I had a coach from in 2006, his name was Greg and now I have Danny and and what I've learned from Danny specifically was that it's you are a whole lot you are a whole lot more satisfying in your life and a whole lot more successful in your in your occupation or your journey of entrepreneurship when you have an intention, not an expectation, because it's all brain science. And an expectation lives in your reptilian brain, and an intention lives in your higher cerebral cortex. And Friedland's a, a master of this because he's literally a trained brain surgeon. So it's not mm -hmm. like it's let's just talk more positively. No, it's it's like let's. <laughs> the way we, we, we deal with problems. So when we have an intention, it's a win-lose. Like, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm sure you've never heard this. I'm going to walk in, I'm going to crush that sales call and I'm going to get this deal. There's so much beyond your control. Good luck with that. Versus yeah. my intention is I'm going to put the best forward of the business. I'm going to listen to my client. I'm going to get the, ascertain their needs and see if I can provide them with the best solution to solve their problems because that's really what salespeople are. We're problem solvers versus... You know, the, the, the guy who listens to the eye of the tiger on the drive to the appointment and I'm going to beat them over the head and I'm going to win. That, that guy's going to suffer a, a lot of misery. And what he's going to do is he's typically going to blame others for his inadequacies versus the person who's like, I want to learn. I want to learn about you. I want to see if I can provide you with some solutions. And I want to have a lot of intentionality around it. And maybe we, John and I can collaborate on a deal versus me beating him over the head for what I want. And in that deal, there's a certain price point that's reasonable for both parties. They can't expect me to work for free. I should make money. I can't mm -hmm. expect them to pay top dollar if that's not appropriate. But if it is a great solution, then I should be able to justify and explain to them from a very intentional mindset of why I charge what I charge. So I just find intentionality so saves us from a lot of suffering. Yeah, no, I love that. I love that because it, it, in many ways, intentionality is something that you have some control over. It's active. It's something you can do expectation you're kind of throwing it out there and and letting you know you're outsourcing it in many ways you're saying you know this is what i want and then as you said there's a whole lot of variables that come into play and it's kind of beyond your control but the intentionality is totally within your control a absolutely I, it's so funny i was single about five years ago and i i, I, I use the intentionality versus in, the i was gonna say intentionally or not <laughs> no, well no <laughs> great uh, yeah, that's, that's a story for a different day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when you're dating someone, and I usually would talk to the, the people I'd go on dates with, and I was just really relaxed about things, and I was very intentional. Like, my, I had two intentions. My intention is I'm going to show up because I can control that. And my intention is to be a really good listener so we can have a really great time and a really great conversation versus the person who walks in with an agenda. And I have expectations. The other party feels that. Men or yeah. women, we feel that. We feel that exchange of energy, that maybe that pressure, that push. Whereas if we're intentional 
and it's it's a mutually exchanging experience, then everybody has a good time. I met wonderful people who just didn't have the chemistry with, but I say, hey, sure. listen, I had a great time. Um, I just didn't feel that spark. And they're like, wow, I really appreciate that. Because again, go back to sales 101. We, we drove to, no, this isn't going to be a sale versus <laughs> yes, this is. And it was just a much more enjoyable experience versus putting all the pressure on myself or the other party, which comes a lot from being so expectational. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a fantastic, uh, a fantastic example, because I think most people can, can relate to that. Listen, Todd, this has been fantastic as usual. Um, and the book is from suck to success, a guide uh, for extraordinary entrepreneurs. Um, all of Todd's information, including the link to the book, and uh, etc, will be below this video. But before we go, Todd, please tell people a little bit more about yourself. Well, so anybody who wants to explore the book further and maybe has some, some buyer's reluctance, you know, you got to talk sales, right? Buy, yeah. A little buyer's reluctance, uh, go to from success.com and I'm going to give you a chapter of the book for free. And it's going to cover a lot of the things that John's been generous enough to talk with you about today. Um, if it, for anybody who wants to have a, a conversation with me about how I can help them get unstuck in their business or in their personal life, go to Todd at extraordinaryadvisors.com and I'm happy to give you 30 minutes of my time no charge. I'm not going to solicit you. It's my chance to, to live my purpose, my why of improving lives. So again, please check out the book, get the free chapter. If you want to have a conversation, go to Todd at extraordinaryadvisors.com and I'm happy to set up a call. Yeah. And I would encourage uh, people to go check it out. And I would encourage people to look at the concept of, uh, of having a coach. Uh, I think it's really, really important. You can see um, Todd's a great example here of it. It's helped him. I've used them in the past myself. I think it's something that uh, everybody should consider. I say this ad nauseum, but I'll say it again, uh, that you probably invest a lot of money in your hobbies. You might even have coaches. You might have teachers, people who help you with your golf swing or something. Yeah. How about investing something in what puts some actual bread on the table? Exactly. <laughs> Could not have said it better myself. <laughs> Thanks, uh. All right. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner, CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.